Amen. The book of Nahum this evening, the book of Nahum, as Pastor mentioned, it's one of those tiny, small books, only three chapters long, uh, found in the Old Testament, the book of Nahum. While we've been studying through the uh, minor prophets uh, throughout this year, a major nation not named Israel has played a major role in these books. We first met this nation in the book of Jonah. When God told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and preach in the capital city of that nation of Assyria, Jonah disobeyed and he went in the other direction. We know the story. God sent a storm. Jonah repented. He went into the city and there in Nineveh, he preached. The people repented and God forgave that city. It's been about 150 years since that great revival. Since then, Assyria has become a great nation and they've ruled over the area. They destroyed the 10 northern tribes of Israel and they brought them off into captivity. And they have been giving great trouble uh, to the uh, two southern tribes and they absolutely devastated much of that area. And it was only by a miraculous intervention of God that the two southern tribes of Judah were not destroyed. When uh, they had them surrounded, they had them sieged, and Hezekiah was a king, a righteous and godly king, and he sought God, and God delivered them. And in the night, uh, lots of Assyrians were killed, not by any Israelite, not by any sword, but by God intervening and rescuing the people. Nearly 100 years have now passed since that event. And Assyria has exhausted her welcome. The Assyrian nation was especially cruel. And none of the other nations that were affected or around the Assyrians would be disappointed by its destruction. They cut off limbs. They gouged out eyes. And then they, they left those poor victims to wander, wander around maimed. Uh, the Assyrians described their torture in great detail on their walls uh, of their imperial places. They created tablets uh, containing all the punishments carried out by their army. You can, uh, there's a slide up here. I don't know if we've uh, got it or not that show these, these different uh, actions that they carried out. And you can see up here, they're, they're banging a guy on the head up here. They're impaling them. They're, they're stretching them out. They're hanging them up uh, here on these, on these uh, stakes. They were... Very cruel and wicked people. And they boasted about it. They were proud of how they treated other people. They were proud of their mass executions. They, they liked to flay uh, the, the rebel leaders and, and take their skin and, and hang it down so all could see uh, what they had done. They, had, they took the, the, the bones. They had the, the nobles of these different nations that they captured to, to take the bones of their, their ancestors and grind them down into powder to, to wipe out any evidence of their... Their, their heritage, that they should be the next kings. It was a, a form of psychological uh, torture and it demonstrated the absolute power that the Assyrian kings had over the subjugated nations. Assyrian soldiers would, would behead their enemies and they would build pyramids out of their skulls. Sometimes they would hang the bones and the skulls of their enemies that they defeated uh, from the trees around their area, almost like we hang uh, uh, bulbs from Christmas trees. And they would hang those around they were especially cruel and wicked nation that ruled over that that area over the Middle East for about 150 years God had used them to judge the the Israelites the northern kingdom for their idolatry but now they've served their purpose their time of judgment had come and that's what the book of Nahum is all about Nahum is God's mouthpiece to pronounce judgment on the mighty nation of Assyria, and in particular, its capital city of Nineveh. The only thing that we know about Nahum is mentioned in verse number one of chapter number one. It says, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. 
Uh, to be honest with you, some people assume that means he's from a little town of Elkos, but we have no idea where that town of Elkos even was. There's no other mention of it in the Bible. There's very little mention of it throughout history. Uh, there are some who believe that it's located in what is now called Capernaum at the north part of the Jordan uh, River. And uh, they named it Capernaum. Capernaum simply means the village of Nahum. And so they, in honor of the prophet Nahum, they named the city Capernaum. But that's just speculation. Uh, there's nothing known about that. And so there's really nothing we know about the prophet Nahum other than what we know he was God's mouthpiece to the Assyrians. The time frame of uh, Nahum's message, he doesn't really give us one of those either. Most people assume that he preached sometime between 663 BC and 612 BC. Since Nahum is preaching about the and predicting about the destruction, the coming destruction of the city of, of Assyria, of Nineveh, it would be safe to assume that he preached before its actual destruction in the year 612. We can also assume that it was written after 663 because Nahum compares to the destruction of Nineveh with the destruction of the city of Thebes down in Egypt, uh, which happened around 663. And so it is likely that Nahum preached sometime between 663 and 612 BC. This book can easily be divided in three different sections. It's, uh, and it's divided by its three different chapters. In the first section, we find the destruction of Nineveh is declared. You know, God is a God of justice. And when there is injustice, he gets angry. He is not happy. He is not content to let injustice prevail. He is slow to anger and patient, but he will, he will judge those who sin. Look at verse number 2 of chapter number 1. The Bible says, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath. For his enemies. God does not tread lightly with sin. When he sees sin, he deals with it. He judges those who sin. And he is not a God to be messed around with. Look in verse 3. It says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and is in the storm. And the clouds and are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake in him and the hills melt and the earth is burdened at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. God can dry up the sea. God can dry up vegetation. He can destroy everything on earth. His power is demonstrated by tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes. God has all the power to do whatever he wants to destroy and to judge any nation he wants. No one can stand in God's way. He is a mighty God and he can destroy any nation. But his anger and his power are tempered by his kindness. Look with me in verse number 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knoweth them that trust in him. God knows those who trust in him, and he will preserve them. You know, this should comfort us when we see the society disintegrating around us. Even though everyone else is bad and wicked and ungodly, we hear about these, these people doing un, un, ungodly and terrible acts. If we remain faithful, God will notice and he will reward us either by protecting us here on earth or by rewarding us in heaven. Oftentimes we feel that, that the blessings have to be now, God, I'm being faithful. Where are your blessings in my life? But eternal rewards are actually better. And they're much more profound and enjoyable for all of eternity. And so sometimes God protects us and he preserves us by taking us home to heaven where we can spend eternity with him. But as for Nineveh, because of their wickedness, their end will be destruction. Look in verse number 8. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof. Speaking of Nineveh, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. 
Note the reference to the flood here in verse 8, the overrunning flood. Nineveh was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians and the Medes and the, the Scythians in, in the year 612. But according to the ancient historian, uh, Diodorus Siculus, the armies besieged the city of Nineveh for more than two years. They had surrounded the city to bring destruction to the city to try to defeat it, but they couldn't get in. Nineveh was protected. They could not enter into the city. But in the third year, the Kosa River, which ran through the city of Nineveh, according to this historian, flooded. And it brought down the gates and a part of the wall that had protected Nineveh. And as a result, the nations that had besieged them, that had surrounded them, were able to enter in. And so, so Nahum is preaching. He's, he's prophesying, you're going to be destroyed by an overrunning flood. And a Many years later, God sent the flood and it wiped out the walls that had, that had protected this city. Nineveh had sinned and God had had enough with them. And he brought destruction to them. How had they sinned? Look with me in verse number 9. It says, what do you imagine against the Lord? They had sinned against God. They were against God. He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they will be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one come out of, uh, come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. You know, God had shown compassion to this nation 150 years earlier when Jonah came into the city and he preached to them and they repented and God spared his wrath, his judgment upon them. But since then, they've rejected God. Since then, they haven't lived a godly life and they've gone against God. So then God declared the complete destruction of this city. Not only would he judge them a little bit, he declares the complete destruction and thus the freedom of Nineveh. In verse 12, it says, Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus they shall be cut down. When he shall pass through, though I've afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Speaking of Judah, now, for now I will break his yoke from off of thee. And will burst thy bonds and sunder. They won't be over Judah anymore. He's going to rescue them. And the Lord hath given thee, given a, uh, given a commandment concerning thee. That no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image. And the molten image. And I will make thy grave for thou art vile. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. That publisheth peace. O Judah keep the solemn feast. Perform thy vows for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is is utterly cut off. God is declaring to the nation of Judah, you're rescued. Assyria is not going to bother you anymore. Nineveh is not going to be a problem to you anymore. They've been against you. They've attacked you. They've, they've bothered you. They've killed many of your, your people, but no more. They're going to be destroyed. Nineveh is going to be completely cut off. Now Nahum assumes the role of a watchman in the tower and announces the arrival of the enemies of Nineveh and describes their destruction. In, ver in chapter number 2, we, the next point, we see the destruction of Nineveh described. The reason this destruction is coming is to restore Jacob. It says in verse number 1 of chapter 2, And he, he that dasheth in pieces is come up before thy face. Keep the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord hath turned away the excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vine branches. And now Nahum sees the enemy army approaching with their red or scarlet shields and red uniforms. It says the real, the shield of his mighty men is made red and the valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches. In the day of his preparation, the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. Some see this as they have their shields and they have their, their garment as, as the crimson, the red. Some see it as all the bloodshed that they're causing. And now the blood is covering their shields as they, they've marched in and they're destroying Assyria. Some believe it's referring to the Babylonians in the, the, Median, the Median army that, that dressed in scarlet and painted their shields in red. But Nahum sees them coming in. God is prophesying that this, this, this army that is coming in is going to bring destruction to the city of Nineveh. Nahum now sees the army moving quickly through the city. In verse 4, the chariots shall rage in the streets. 
They shall jostle one, another, one against another in a broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. He shall recount his worthies. They shall stumble in their walk. They shall make haste to the wall thereof. And the fence shall be prepared. Nineveh is ready for destruction. They can't stand before the wrath of God. The Babylonians and the Medes and the Scythians are, are God's instrument to bring judgment upon them. And they, God, Nahum sees this army entering in with their chariots and they're so quick. They enter the city, the flood comes and knocks down the city gates and a part of the wall. And therefore the army enters in and all of a sudden they are everywhere bringing destruction upon this huge city that was absolutely a massive city, but they're like torches, they're like lightning scattered all around, bringing destruction upon the Assyrians. And Nahum sees this army moving quickly, and then he sees the rivers overflowed and the walls collapsing, as we saw in verse 6. The gates of the river shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. God is bringing destruction upon this city. All the wealth they had plundered and they had stolen from other nations is now going to be taken from them. As it says in verse number 9 of chapter 2, Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, speaking to the nations that are attacking Assyria. For there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. She is empty and void and waste. And the heart melteth, the knees smite together, and much pain is in all the loins. And all the faces of them all gather blackness. The same as Storty and Diordius uh, Cyclus uh, said there was so much loot that when the Assyrian army was fleeing out of the city of Nineveh, the army said, uh-uh, we're staying here, we're gathering everything up. We're taking all the gold, all the silver, and we're gathering it here. And they were just, there was just so much wealth in that city that they had stolen from these other nations, that they were gathering it up and together. And that's what he is seeing. Take the spoil of the silver and the gold. These armies were, were taking all this loot. They grabbed everything they could. And then Nahum compares the destruction of the city to a lion. In verse number 11, uh, chapter 2, it says, Where is the dwelling of the young lions? In the feeding place of the young lions. Where the lion, even the old lion, walked, and the lions whelped, and none made them afraid. The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps and strangled for his lioness and filled his holes with prey and his dens with raven. The Assyrians were, were people that were fascinated with lions. Uh, they would, uh, they were, there's all, been several sculptures that have found showing the Assyrian kings hunting lions in their area and uh, offering lions as sacrifices unto their gods. The Assyrians were, were the kings of the beast. They, they devastated other nations. They, they were fascinated with lions. They were fierce in their conquest. They were like lions of people amongst the nations. And as Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, as, as uh, Nahum describes here, is called the den of lions. It's uh, the dens. He fills his dens with raven. The, the capital city is the den of the lions. And now Nahum is asking, where is the dwelling of the lions? What has happened to you? What has happened to this mighty city? A den of lions was where the, the mighty beasts lived unmolested. How many of you would be interested in walking into a den of lions? No, I don't think so. Uh, that doesn't sound appealing to me. But Nahum is asking, that den's there no longer. What happened to it? Where's the dwelling place of this, these mighty people, these fierce people? They're going to be so utterly destroyed. They, these lions would often take their prey from distant lands and they, they took it into their den just like the Assyrians did. The members of that lair feared no adversary as long as they were in their then Assyria, as long as they, in, in Nineveh, as long as they were in their town, they had nothing to be afraid of. They were in the den of the lions. But now Nahum is saying, where's your dwelling place, young lions? Where are you going now? You're in trouble. The lion's den, Nineveh, is being destroyed. And then like a lion challenging the king for control. God declares in verse number 13. Behold I am against thee. Saith the Lord of hosts. And I will burn her chariots in the smoke. And the sword shall devour thy young lions. And I will cut off thy prey from the earth. And the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. You notice the title Lord of hosts. That God used his name. There, the Lord of hosts, he declares that Assyria is not the one who's in control of other nations. 
They thought they were the ones in control. They were the ones that brought the kings of Judah and the kings of Israel under their power. They brought the other nations under their power. They thought they were the ones in control. And God says, I don't think so. I'm the Lord of hosts. I'm the one who's in control of other nations. I'm the one who has the power over these people. God is the one above all nations. The chariots of Assyria that struck fear into the, the people of ancient is Middle East. God says, I will destroy. I will burn her chariots in the smoke. God says, your massive weapons that you had that caused great fear in other nations. I'm wiping it out. I'm not afraid of anything you have. I will destroy your, your chariots. Their lions, their army, as he said, will be devoured by, by the sword. All the control, the prey, as it said in verse number 13, the prey that they had accumulated during the years of war destruction would be cut off by God. They would no longer have control. And the other nations will no longer succumb to their demands. God says, I am the one in control. You know, God allows wicked nations to rise sometimes. And he uses nations like Assyria, like Babylon. And they think they're the ones in control. He uses nations like the United States. But the United States is not the ones in control. God is the one in control. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the all-powerful one. And he can raise up nations and he can destroy nations. It depends on whether they're seeking God or not. He raised up Israel and he took down Israel. God is the God. He is the Lord of hosts. And he is the one in control. And Assyria was a powerful nation. And they thought they had all control. And God said, no. I am the Lord of hosts. God describes through the prophet Nahum the terrible destruction that was coming to, Na to this city of Nineveh. Then Nahum closes this book declaring that the destruction of Nineveh was deserved. They deserve this destruction. Nineveh was a bloody city, declared Nahum in chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. It was a city that was built through war and cruel oppression. The wealth of the palace was due to, to lies, fraud, deception in both business and government. And robbery, robbery that, that violently took, took away what rightfully belonged to other people. It was a wicked nation. That had grown to power out of wickedness. And now Nahum gives some more detailed descriptions of, of the attack on Nineveh. Except that the images he uses this time are even more gruesome and more, more intense and fierce than before. In verse 2 it says, The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the prancing horses and, the, and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. Nahum sees in this vision, he hears the whips of the, the guys who entered into the city driving their chariots. And they're all over their place, prancing their horses and their wheels are jumping over and they're causing destruction throughout the city of Nineveh and they're killing so many people and as people die and they send in the second waves of the army into the city to, to attack the city of Nineveh, they're stepping over the corpses trying to get into the city, there's so much death there's so much destruction that is caused upon this mighty city it's a terrible, terrible scene he hears the, the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the, the horse Horses jumping around. It's a, it's a scene that is absolutely horrible that is coming upon this mighty city of, of uh, Nineveh. But why? Why is the destruction coming? Look in verse number four. It says, Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well favored harlot, the mistress of, the witch, of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Nineveh is going to be destroyed because of idolatry. He calls it whoredoms or, or prostitution here. She had charmed other nations with her wealth and her religion and her art and her commerce and her science. Her well-disciplined armies incited weaker nations to, to seek an alliance with this nation of Assyria. However... When these lovers did not obey in, their slight, in her slightest whim, the harlot sold her allies and she, she turned against them and, and she enslaved them. King Ahaz, 
of Judah was one of those, the father of King Hezekiah, who was drawn into the orbit of the Syrian uh, allies. And he saw what they did and he was, he was marveled by their power and he was so excited by what they had done. And he was, we've got to do that as well. And he entered into that and he, he set up that altar down in, in Jerusalem that they had built in Assyria as well in Nineveh. And he made a replica down there because he wanted to be just like the Assyrians. And they had turned the hearts of even God's people away from Jehovah God. But over time, poor King Ahaz paid a terrible price for what he had done for his idolatry. He set Judah down a terrible path and God brought great judgment. If it wasn't for his godly king Hezekiah, Judah as well could have been destroyed and carried off into captivity by the Assyrian army. In the ancient Middle East, prostitutes were, were often brought before a crowd of people and they were then exposed and then killed. And that is what God declares he's going to do with this nation of Assyria. Look in verse number five. He said, behold, I am against thee. Saith the Lord of hosts, I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdom sh thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that they shall that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. And who will be moan her? Whence shall they I seek comforters? For thee, the nakedness of the harlot would be publicly exhibited before the kingdoms of the earth. She would be disgraced before other nations. Nineveh would become a, a spectacle to others. All who watched the humiliation and desecration of Nineveh would flee because the greatest city on the face of the earth, as it said here, is laid waste. It, the city is absolutely laid waste. But no one would mourn the death of Nineveh. It said in verse number seven, who's going to bemoan her? No one's going to miss her. No one's going to care that Nineveh's gone. There, there's a party going around in the Middle East. They're excited that that nation is going to be destroyed. They had been influenced by her. They had been scared by her. They're not going to miss her. Who's going to bemoan her? No one would seek to comfort Nineveh in her humiliation. Instead, they would say, good riddance. We're not sad that you're gone. Hearing in his mind the doubts of others about the destruction of this mighty city of Nineveh, Nahum reminds the city of, uh, reminds the people of the city of No in verse number eight. It says, Art thou better than populous No? That's a great city name, is it not? The city of No. My kids think that's the city they belong in. And uh, when they're in my house, the city of No. The city of No is, a, is the old name for what we would know as the, the city of Thebes. Uh, the great city of Thebes, called No here, was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And, and he says here in verse 8, Art thou better than populous No, that was situated among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were, were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lub Lubim were, were thy, uh, thy helpers, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity and her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. And they cast lots for her honorable men. And all her great men were bound in chains. This great city of uh, Thebes was located in, uh, in the large bend of the, of the Nile River where the river was closest to the Red Sea. It was the capital of a powerful empire at this time uh, when it fell. Uh, Egypt and Ethiopia had, had joined together and put in, uh, the, uh, the nation of Lubum uh, were its allies of this ruling dynasty. However, this mighty city had been destroyed. The attackers had no respect even for the defenseless. It talks about how her, her, it says in verse 10, yet she was carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of the streets. There, even the children were killed in the city of Thebes. It talks about how they didn't have respect for them. They, they cast lots for the soldiers, for the honorable men of the, of the city. And they brought them as slaves. The diplomats and the government officials were taken away into chains. And they were bound in chains, it says in verse 10, and became slaves. Thebes was supposedly, during this time, an invincible city. The Ninevites would have thought that we too are invincible. No one can take out of our city. It's good. Egypt had great allies. Assyria did too. But Thebes was destroyed. And Nineveh would have known this. You know why? Because Nineveh, the nation of Assyria, was the one that destroyed the city of Thebes. 
This city of Thebes that was thought to be indestructible was destroyed by Nineveh. And now Nahum is preaching. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. And they're thinking, ah, that's impossible. We're a great nation. No one can attack us. No one can destroy us. And Nahum said, remember that city Thebes you destroyed? No one thought they could be destroyed either. And yet they were destroyed. And so you too, Nineveh, will be destroyed. You think you're invincible. You think you can't be defeated. You don't know God. Because God is all-powerful. As we mentioned in the beginning, He's the one that creates hurricanes and floods and tornadoes. He's the one that brings destruction. And God says it's going to happen in verse 12. He says, All thy strongholds shall become like fig trees with the first striped figs. And if they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. And so the fig tree, when it's ripe, all you had to do is shake that tree a little bit and all the fruit uh, comes falling down and under attacking forces, Nineveh is going to stagger like a drunk person. In verse 13, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are, are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide upon thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. She's going to have no place to hide. Their, their army, their enemies, the, or their army is going to act like a, a bunch of women. There's not going to be any power in them. They're not going to, they're going to be weak. They're going to be defenseless. They're not going to be able to stand against the army that's coming in. Complete destruction was approaching this city of Nineveh. And so Nahum tells Nineveh they'd better get ready. As you can read down through verses 14 through 18 uh, for sake of time we're not going to read the verses but he tells them these verses he says the city must be prepared for a long siege. He says they must draw water for the siege. They must strengthen the city's defenses. They, they have to make more bricks to reinforce the vulnerable spots. And he says however you're not going to be able to stand against the sword because God has declared destruction. In verse number 15, he says, There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like a canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as locusts. Multiply yourself. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants. But you're going to act like a bunch of locusts who are scattered, like grasshoppers scattered all across the place. Nahum, the God through Nahum is preaching, declaring to them that they will be destroyed. And the book of Nahum concludes with a graphic image of the aftermath of destruction. In verse 18, he said, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brood of thee shall clap their hands over thee. For upon whom hath that not thy wickedness passed continually? Nahum informs the king of Assyria that all his under shepherds, his secondary rulers, his government officials, all of them are going to die. The people are going to scatter to all places of the earth. Only the king remains. He's the lone survivor of the entire empire. Even the king of Assyria is going to receive a, a serious wound in verse number 19. And no one can ease the pain of this king. The Assyrian monarchy, uh, history tells us, would continue after the fall of Nineveh for about three years. But with the loss of their capital and most of their army, uh, the, the tyrant uh, Nineveh had been struck a deadly wound. And in, a wound in six, uh, the year 606... King, or 609, excuse me, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians attacked what remained of Nineveh and he brought complete destruction upon that town. Nineveh was completely annihilated. The great city that was founded by Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10 before the Tower of Babel, the great city that was about three miles wide and eight miles long, the great city was so completely destroyed by flood and by armies that when, King, when Alexander the Great had fought a battle in nearby Arbella in the year 331 B.C., he did not know that the city had been there before. He fought nearby, but there was no evidence that this great city of Nineveh had ever existed. It was completely destroyed. In fact, Nineveh the, it was not discovered by archaeologists until the year 1850. So for almost 2,000 years, there were skeptics who doubted the Bible, who doubted the book of Jonah, who doubted the book of Nahum, because there was no evidence of the city of Nineveh. There was no proof that this great city existed. And so they thought it was fairy tales that had been made up. And it wasn't until the year 1850 that archaeologists once again discovered this great city of Nineveh. This amazing city, this mighty city, was completely laid to waste. Just as God predicted that it would happen. So what can we learn from this short book? This book obviously shows that, that bad people get what they deserve. Uh, no one was sad to see 
the destruction of the city of Nineveh. People throughout the Middle East felt like Jonah and were glad when judgment had come upon this nation. They were, they were horrible, wicked people. But we must remember that this judgment came because of the character of God, as we saw in the, in the opening verses, that God is a just God. That means that we must consider circumstances in the light of who God is. And the book reveals quite a bit about who God is and about His character. The first thing we see is that God is a sovereign God. God is a sovereign God. He is in control of both nature and nations. He had forgiven the Assyrians after they repented, and then He used this nation to bring judgment upon the northern kingdom. But His, but his cup of judgment had become full because of their wickedness. And now God will use the Babylonians, another wicked nation, to judge the Assyrians. But knowing that the Babylonians would not be able to defeat this great city in and of themselves, God sent a flood to help them. You see, God's in control. He is a sovereign God. Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. We look around our nation and we wonder, God, where are you? We look around our world and say, God, what are you doing? How can they be powerful? How can wicked people rise up like this? God, where are you? God, why are you allowing this to happen? But we must remember that God is in control. And even though we don't understand what he's doing, we can trust him. He is a God that is all powerful. He is in control. He's a sovereign God. We also see that he's a just God. A serious judgment was well deserved. And although God used them to destroy Israel, they were filled with pride and attributed, attributed their success to their own power. Then God destroyed them. So God is a fair God. He will judge those who deserve it. Sometimes we want to bring judgment into our own hands. Sometimes we want to raise up and place ourselves in the place of God. But we must remember that God will bring judgment. Maybe not in our time. Maybe not in a way that we think it's deserved, but he is a just God who will not allow wickedness to go unpunished. He will judge those who deserve it. Perhaps not here and now or in the way we think they deserve, but God is faithful who will judge in his time. And finally, we see that God is a faithful God who protects his people. That would be us, his, the Christians. Although God used Assyria to discipline Israel, he kept an eye on the faithful. As Hezekiah led the southern tribe of Judah back to God, God would intervene for the Israelites in, in Jerusalem and de deliver them from the full wrath of this wicked nation. And Nahum reminds us that God is in control. When things seem impossible, like the fall and destruction of a mighty city of Nineveh, we must remember that we can trust God. We can trust God. When we don't understand why God allows bad things to happen or wicked people to be in control, we must remember that we can trust God. Look with me once again in, ch in chapter number 1, verse number 7. It says, the Lord is good. We can just stop there, can't we? Yeah. Amen. God is good. He's a good God to us. He's in control. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. When life's falling apart, when life is difficult, when we don't understand what's going on, we can run into God. We can put our faith and our trust in Him. We can cast all our cares upon Him because He cares for us. He's a stronghold in day of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust Him, that trust in Him. He knows us. You know, God knows you. God thinks about you. He thinks about what's going on in your life. He understands struggles that you're going through. He knows the difficulties you're going through. He knows how, ba how bad things are at your job or how wicked people are and how they're being unfair to you. He knows what the struggles that are going on in your home. God knows what is going on in life. He knows those who trust in Him. Does God know you? Do you trust in Him? God knoweth those who trust in Him. Do you trust him even when things don't make sense to you? Do you trust that he is a sovereign God? Do you trust that he's a just God? Do you trust that he's a faithful God? Those are practical applications that we can learn from the book of Nahum. That God is sovereign. That God is just. And that God is faithful. All we have to do is trust in him. Let us pray. Thank you for joining us for part of a Sunday service at Community Baptist Church. I hope to meet you soon. May God impress his love upon your heart this week.